first question. Um, what research of yours are you most proud of and why? Um, I think I'm, I'm most proud of Weapons of the Week. That is to say, it's my, it's my one time of operating like a real anthropologist when you're at work from when you open your eyes in the morning to when you close them at night. I think I had to master a peasant dialect. Uh, I don't think I've ever worked as hard in my life uh, before or since. Uh, and I don't think I also, I don't think I ever learned more, more quickly than, I mean, it was like, uh, you know, like a Strasbourg goose that was just sort of coming at me. I was almost choking on the things that I thought I understand, understood. And, you know, there were kind of 4,000 pages of notes at the end of my stay, uh, most of which turned out to be uh, less than completely relevant. But it was a, uh, it was a, uh, actually, as my son once said, that, that, uh, when he said he would like every day to be completely different than the day before, mm -hmm. right? Just because it's new and fresh and you're taking everything in. Um, and he said that, you know, that if you have a sort of an amazing day of new experiences and so on, that is, right, mm -hmm. that counts for a whole lot more living mm -hmm. than uh, a much longer time that's kind of Boy. static and boring and repetitive. Uh, and uh, I don't quite agree with him because I like a certain amount of routine in my life. Uh, but the fact is that it was coming at me like, um, uh, oh, like looking out a train window and seeing the landscape go by. And so uh, I, I, I tried harder. I think I learned more. And so there was a lot of there was more blood, sweat, and tears mm. in that book uh, because you're there as a full person in a sense in a village. But evolutionary in a sense. What, what did you go to there to do? Oh, I went there to study class relations and mechanization um, in this uh, agricultural area and the, the relations between rich and poor people. And so, I mean, I, I did end up. That's basically what I did end up studying, but the way in which I ended up studying it. And uh, it's worth mentioning, actually, in terms of field work. So like a good little political scientist, I had uh, uh, I wanted to do household uh, studies of income, a division of labor, you know, uh, expenditures. Um, and and I, I went household by household. Is this in the 4,000 pages? What? Yeah, it's in the 4,000 pages. Doing, I had a little survey instrument about what they planted it, when they planted it, what their yields were, uh, what the work the children did, uh, how much they got for it, how much land they owned, how much land they rented, and so on. So I had all of that. And so I thought my job was to sort of complete my survey and bag all 70 households, which I did eventually. <laughs> and. I regarded um, things would just happen. Um, so, you know, there was in that book. There's a episode about whether to put a gate across the village, mm -hmm. uh, and then there was something about the fertilizer subsidy, and then there was something about uh, materials for outhouses uh, and so on. And then there were disputes, and so, uh, you know, if you're there in a village for two years, the village has to get on with its life without you, right? I mean, they can't stop, right? And just pose for you for the next two years. And so things happened. And I regarded, people wanted to talk about these things. And I regarded these things initially as something that diverted me from my survey research and my orderly progress, wow. right? Of establishing the empirical foundations of the village. And it took me better part of a year before I realized, you know, when one of these things happens, it's like a kind of fracture in a community. You then begin to see affiliations, things you wouldn't have otherwise mm -hmm. seen, how the village fits together. And that was what was really happening was less my orderly research and survey than understanding in a dispute uh, the kind of underlying structure of village affiliations and so on. That's amazing. Did you ever end up doing anything with the first part of the study? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, you'll see that it was actually, it wasn't, 
it, it wasn't even remotely a waste of my time because I kind of then understood the kind I understood the material situation of many of these uh, many of these villagers in a way in which I didn't understand it before uh, the difference between having a little bit of land and being completely landless the uh, difference between having a wife or a husband who came from a family that had a little bit of land as opposed to a spouse whose family had no land at all. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, I don't think, I mean, uh, it was not a waste of my time. What was wrong about my perspective is I thought that was the only thing I was doing, right? And if I had just, as a lot of people do, they, you know, fly in, take their survey and, uh, and fly out and then uh, Put together an article, and so I don't know if you know uh, an old colleague of mine at Wisconsin, Murray Edelman, uh, yeah. made some of the original critiques of survey research that that someone will answer a question, but you don't have no idea whether they ever had an opinion about this until they were asked, yeah. and whether they're having an opinion because you asked them, and the second later they have forgotten all about it and has no reality in their life, and so or how stable it is if you ask them one Wednesday rather than Tuesday, I like the Heisenberg principle. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, in that sense, um, uh, if that's all you're doing, then, then, then the material that you're collecting is an artifact of your preconceptions. And you don't, there's nothing of going with the flow and trying to figure out, how do these people understand their lives? How do they make sense of it? Uh, how do they talk about it, mm -hmm. rather than how my social science categories uh, impel me to ask them about it. In line with this, though, um, it seems like um, what I found fascinating, right, was um, um, I found uh, conversations with Chuck Tilley, for example, to be amazing. But then you think of um, it's hard to teach Chuckness, right? I mean, like, how do you teach right. that kind of um, sweep? Or in this context, how, how do you train someone to um, see or hear experiences and then kind of, so in a sense you're kind of taking these uh, reflections or refractions off of these mirrors to get some sense of this latent concept that you can't really get to. Um, and I mean, not, not, not how do you treat some, how do you teach someone to kind of, um, to be you and your sensibilities, but, um, but, but how do you do that? I mean, like, is, I, 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 does the art form end with you? Does the skill set um, to kind of see these distinct combinations mm. in the ways that you did? How, how do you communicate that to your students or the people that you kind of interact with? Uh, do you think that's possible, or is it this kind of? It is an art. It is a. It is a sensibility. It is a. It is a worldview that is hard to communicate to somebody else if they don't already have that sensibility. Well, like I mean, I don't think I'm distinctive at all in that in that way. In the sense that, um, in a sense. Everything is idiosyncratic, mm -hmm. even if we all go in with the same tools uh, and so on. We all build something that's distinctive to us. Um, the, uh, but I, I take your point. I, I've thought about this um, with uh, Clifford Geertz, for example. So there's a kind of unique. Uh, how do you teach Geertzness, yeah. as uh, to put it in your terms? And so, uh, and in fact, in Geertz's case. Um, he didn't really have a method, um, except thick dis what he called thick, thick description. description. Yeah. Um, I have the books on. And uh, and the the result was that he didn't have. You can't say there's a Geert school hmm. of anthropology. On the other hand. Levi Strauss, in his mythologies, right, had essentially a kind of toolkit for understanding yeah. oppositions and myths mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And there is a Levi Strauss school, and there still is. And you know, they give you a little black bag with uh, the Levi Strauss tools, <laughs> and you end up you you go and collect people's myths and you uh, analyze them. And I think. The the problem with the Levi Strauss thing is that it, it is it is a toolkit. It uh, it travels across cultures, but it misses something. But it yeah it doesn't have a real encounter with the with the culture. Mm -hmm. um, and the so here's what I think. 
the Geertz method has, and I would like to think the Scott method has also, is that in, in terms of social science. So uh, it seems to me that much of social science is, in a sense, conducted behind people's backs, in the sense, in, in the following sense, that um, the uh, like a survey, uh, it doesn't insist on having an encounter with what these people think they're doing, yeah. right? That is to say, if your job is to understand someone's behavior, which most social science is, and, and routinely we give credit to elites for having tastes and opinions and ideologies and so on. We're dealing with ordinary people or masses or whatever. Yeah. We tend to kind of read their opinions off their literacy, their education, their right sort of gross things. And it seems to me that it is uh, not only scientifically impermissible, but it's also rude <laughs> and disrespectful to not first, when you're understanding anyone's behavior, is to figure out, or, or a group for that matter, uh, what they imagine themselves to be doing mm -hmm. and the categories in which they understand that they're doing it. doesn't mean that they're telling you the truth. It doesn't mean that they're not somewhat self-deceived themselves, right? All of that is true. This is not uh, transparent, mm -hmm. right? This information is not kind of transparent and, and all that easy to interp interpret it. But the idea that you can do social science and understand people's behavior without an encounter with what they think they're doing yeah. and reconciling that with what you understand that this is impermissible and it's rude and it's unscient and it's and it's scientifically uh, defective mm. right. so. did, did you um, engage with um, Goffman stuff at all uh, that much sure, you, you, sure. You think, I, I thought one of the great things about Goffman was he could take something that you thought was completely empty and trivial and banal like how people say hello Right, and then you know, show you that lots of things are happening here. Right, mm -hmm. uh, the little the stuff in, in institutions, or is it hospitals, or people you know giving cigarettes to one another? Uh, or vaguely remember stuff. the idea. Yeah. Great stuff. Um, number two, um, what led you to undertake the research project for which you are most widely known? What led you to which weapons, is weapons of the week? Of the week yeah. um, so I did a. Um, uh, you have it over there, moral economy of the peasant. Mm -hmm. So, after I did Moral Economy of the Peasant, I, would, I was asked, I think I've said this before in another interview, I was asked, you know, where I did my field work. And I'd look down at my shoes and be embarrassed and um, have to admit that I, it wasn't field work. I was a, I was a library dissertation, as it were, right, mm -hmm. just by reading stuff uh, and trying to absorb it. Wow. And it was about that time also that, you know, I, I was teaching about wars of peasant liberation, and I decided it would be a worthy thing to spend a life understanding peasants. Uh, so I, I decided that I wanted to devote a lot of time to sort of understanding peasants, because they're most of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just, I, because I hadn't done field work and because I kind of embarrassed to admit that I hadn't, and I had anthropology envy, um, <laughs> I then decided that, uh, this is when I was still at Wisconsin, that what I needed, if I was going to do this seriously, mm. I needed to spend a couple of years in a real village so that every time I had a um, generalization, I could check it against a real place that I knew like the back of my hand and it would keep wow. me honest somehow, right, to know one place really well, yeah. uh, not being a peasant myself. And so I decided to spend two years in this Malay village and I had to arrange that with Yale and so on because uh, they didn't like me being gone for two years, but they agreed. Um, and um, I was told uh, by more than one person at Wisconsin before I left that this was a career ending move. Yes. Yeah, for to study, you know, to study a village, a little village in Malaysia. So I said, you're a knucklehead, right? This is a, uh, uh, and I thought, well, maybe it is. I felt, you know, I didn't want to destroy it. It was not as if I set out to destroy my career, but mm -hmm. they were convinced I was destroying my career. And, and it, it turned out to be, uh, it turned out to be not only not destroying my career, but it turned out to work out really fine. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, I think I remember you saying someplace, um, that in a sense, domination out of resistance came from kind of responses that you got from weapons of the week. Um, right. So, uh, do you find that um, you have this kind of sequential? You you kind of hear what your what your audience, what the readers are kind of saying, and you're kind of like, oh, okay, actually, maybe I should go in that direction. I wish 
I wish that were more true than it is. Okay. Um, the, I mean, it's certainly it's, in that particular case. W what was I found myself, you know, in Weapons of the Week. I found myself talking to the rich and then talking to the poor and then talking to the rich and poor together and realizing I was getting different transcripts, that idea of the hidden transcript and so on. And so it occurred to me that that was a, that there was something general there and that I might try to draw that out in more general terms than just in the Malay village. And so that's what impelled me to write Domination and the Arts of Resistance. And to, you know, uh, uh, no reason why you should know, but it's the, it's, the, it's the only book of mine that's kind of really traveled far afield in terms of, uh, so I don't know if you know the, the Q manuscripts. These are the, is essentially many of them from the Dead Sea Scrolls and the, it, or they are the variant uh, versions of the New Testament Gospels. Okay. Uh, and, and it turns out that biblical scholars somehow got a hold of domination in the arts of resistance and figured that these were the hidden transcripts that illuminated the wow. official Gospels. Excellent. And that could be read against one another. And so I found myself invited to Arizona for the American Society for the Study of the Bible and the American Society for the Study of Religion that meet together and is this how I would have about never dreamed in a million years I'd have anything to do with these folks. Is this how you get involved with uh, Elaine Pagel's work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so curious. Uh, um, so in the in the issue of kind of um, kind of thinking about generaliz generalizability and also thinking about just getting a case right, um, there's this interesting tension, right? So. Weapons of the Week is all of, is seems to be largely about trying to get trying to understand what's taking place in this location, um, and then it's the issue of uh, generalizability and how does it travel. Right. So, do you feel that, um, that that it's kind of a division of labor between the books that Domination and Resistance was the the potentially travelable travelable theory, yeah. and and Weapons of the Week was getting the mechanisms right in a sense. Yeah, it's a nice it's a nice analogy. I I, I think that what uh, what I turned out to be able to do pretty well is to, I mean, from a certain point of view, Weapons of the Week really was about, you know, pretty ordinary village, no big deal, not, no, there wasn't any, it wasn't Zapata's village, there wasn't a revolution going on there, you know, it wasn't in the middle, in the middle of the drug wars, I mean, it was, nobody would have singled this village out for any particular, right? Uh, but you didn't necessarily thing. pick it because of its degree of normalcy. I picked it because, well, I mean, I was kind of lazy, I picked it because I was thinking of a fishing village and then... Fishing villages are really complicated because every day is like another harvest, right? And it's just unbelievably difficult. <laughs> and I figured that rice, you know, it's like there are two fish catches a year, and it's pretty straightforward. And then that monocrop village and it's a rice area. So I mean, I made uh, and I and I chose an area that that a Japanese scholar had studied a little bit and done some sort of basic work, um, and people had studied the area. So I, I tried to kind of be parasitic as much as I could on work that other people had done and sort of start with their kind of base. Um, but I think the reason why Weapons of the Week did not sink without a trace is that I was somehow able to use it to raise larger issues about hegemony and ideology uh, toward the end of it. And so I, I managed to take uh, a set of kind of um, ordinary facts, if you like, uh, and a village that nobody had any reason to care about, mm -hmm. and to use it as a way of discussing what we understand about hegemony and ideology mm -hmm. and uh, um, the discourse of conflict uh, in this village, and and so it got read by and the, and the idea that these forms of resistance actually in other places can add up like desertion and, mm -hmm. and so on uh, and poaching, um, and so. It got read, not for it, what it could tell you about this Malay village, it got read for, people were interested in Gramsci at the time, I was interested in Gramsci, yeah. the everyday resistance stuff. And so the, the, th the place, the, the book that's different is, in some ways is, is Domination in the Arts of Resistance because 
it's a kind of a high altitude yeah. book looking at this process in general. It doesn't have any particular resting place on the ground. Whereas, you know, for although it's fairly high altitude too, uh, that uh, the art of not being governed is you know about a special particular place in Southeast Asia, yeah. and if it and if it gets longer legs than that, it's because yeah. there's some mileage in the idea of non-state space and yeah. escape from the state uh, and the history of stateness. And so I've tried, and I think actually that's what I try to tell students. So you know, you're studying, you know, oh well, you're studying squatters in uh, Dakar. Well, that's fine. Uh, so, in what larger problems does this rest, and what is it about what you found out, discovered, and so on, that someone who doesn't give a shit about Dakar and squatters in Dakar, but is interested in, you know, either the control over property, yeah. uh, kind of state sort of forced resettlement of people, uh, whatever. Uh, so the so your job to the extent that you have something that's place-based. Your job is to figure out what you have that travels mm -hmm. from that place and would interest someone else. Uh, otherwise, you may be even you may be brilliant and it may be really good and it may be a great little monograph, but you're going to leave the job to others then mm -hmm. to, to, to generalize and take credit for your insights unless you try to uh, see how far you can run with them yourself. Uh, three, um, looking back at the evolution of the field over the course of your career, what do you think should have received more attention of your work and are there things... Of my work. Of your own work and are there things that you could, you believe should have received less attention, um, both in the field and your own work? Right. Mm. So I actually, is my... Uh, this brings us back to Tilly, mm -hmm. right? The, my uh, my friendly beef with Tilly is that he had this set of criteria for a social movement, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and it had to be public. It had, you know, he, and and uh, it seemed to me that that's fine as a definition of uh, social movement. Mm -hmm. I've got you know, definitions are kind of almost right by definition. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends what you could make of them. And so I don't object to that definition. It seemed to me that if Weapons of the Week uh, was uh, of any value at all, what it suggested was that there is a whole realm of things that are beneath the gaze of Tilly that are, I think, the sort of politics of most of the people in the world through most of history. And so I don't care if you want to call it a social movement or not. I, I think that stuff ought not to be neglected mm. because it has huge effects and is, in fact, the political action of most of history's mm. actors. And so I actually think that, I mean, now people say, oh, that's weapons of the week, whatever. Uh, and uh, But I think... Uh, uh, I think it could have been carried much further, and I thought what it did was to uh, open a door mm. on, I mean, people in contemporary liberal democracies have this idea of what's politics and where the frontiers of politics end. And so the kind of stuff I'm talking about is not of interest to them because it's not at the center of politics in the countries they study. And so, um, anyway... Uh, I would have been happier if that if, if people had sort of taken that further uh, in a way that I didn't. Um, the um, uh, I suppose I mean here I just sound like an old fart kvetching, but um, the it just seems to me that that um, in a sense there's been a um, the envy of neoclassical economics, which itself is breaking up, um, and the desire to see to what levels of analytical refinement and formal theory you can push the individual maximizing actor as a way of understanding politics. I actually believe uh, there are some things you can understand uh, using those tools. Um, but for that to be the 
kind of lodestar of the discipline seems to me to ignore the traditional world of political economy. To I mean, it, it seems to leave out whole realms of political understanding um, that um, I think um, it impoverishes us. It's, it's a little like medieval scholasticism of you know how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. There's a kind of refinement mm. and cuteness and and uh, sophistication to it. But but, that's a great deal. Right. Mm. So, uh, but you know, I'm uh, I'm old enough so that where the discipline goes, you know, it's I mean, in, in you know, I'm all right, Jack, kind of thing. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I don't care if the discipline goes to hell in a handbasket, uh, and. Uh, on the other hand, the large-spirited me, mm. uh, which is not always there, uh, the large-spirited me uh, wants to make the discipline safe for people who I think do excellent imaginative work who mm. don't fit in the rigid prescriptions of uh, many of the rational choice. I'm very, I should add, I'm Five years ago, eight years ago, I would be, I would have been very pessimistic about the discipline. I'm a whole lot more optimistic now, partly because of... What uh, happened? What? What happened? Why Why? Oh, why so, you know, everybody decides that they've got to have training in qualitative method, methods for what it's worth. It's sort of, you know, my rigor is just as long as your rigor kind of bullshit. <laughs> uh, and so there's something, there's an aspect to it that I don't much like. but. Um, the fact is that that um, I think um, this guy who did the study of the slaughterhouse, everybody said he wouldn't get a job. He had his pick of jobs, uh, including Michigan, I might, I might add. Um, and so it seems to me that that um, they may not know it yet. But the sort of the the consensus paradigm is um, running out of steam. Mm -hmm increasingly bankrupt, uh, and its marginal gains are, I, I think, I may be wrong, uh, very small. The problem is that every every hegemony tries to reproduce itself by hiring people, usually who are actually less imaginative, in their own image, right? And so these things have to work their way through the sort of genealogy. So it seems that the, uh, the new book is um, pushing many of these boundaries, right? So it, so it revisits the hidden transcript issue, it, it, it revisits the... You mean anarchism? Yeah. It revisits the um, the challenging hegemony. It uh, tends to... Do you think it brings it back in a different way, or um, completely different kind of orientation? I... Um, in the sense that, you, in the sense that you're... You, so it, what's it, what's here is not also it, what what kind of um, Chuck would classify as a social movement or social movement activities. The anarchist um, activities that you're talking about right. would kind of they would still be part of this lower group. Oh, I see but, what you mean. Right. Yeah, but but distinct from right. discourse, perhaps, um, and other um, ways that people.